You know, the more that I weave my way through the weird paths of film history, the more that I'm fascinated by the 1950s, in large part because of just how unstable and volatile an environment it was at its start. Going into the decade, the studio system was rocked by both the rise of television and the consequences of the landmark antitrust case United States vs. Paramount that forced studios to divest themselves from movie theater chains, the combination of which produced a massive shock to the system and to everybody's wallets. One of the results of the shifting landscape was that the B picture, the low budget back half of a double bill, often a genre picture like a western or a crime drama, was shaken up. Major studios had begun eliminating them from their yearly rosters in order to shift their focus to blockbusters, while smaller B-picture suppliers like Republic and RKO were going out of business altogether. And yet the demand for them still very much existed. For up-and-coming independent filmmakers, this was an opportunity to nab an abandoned spot of real estate and to spin it into something successful. Enter Sam Arkov and James Nicholson of American International Pictures, who would do just that. See, one of the inherent problems they found with the B-Picture business was just how unreliable a market it could be. For instance, although produced for only around $100,000, Apache Woman, one of Roger Corman's first movies, struggled to turn a profit for AIP because in those days, the supplier of the B-Picture was only entitled to a flat rate fee from the theaters that booked it whereas the supplier of the A picture, in this case Universal and their Audie Murphy war drama To Hell and Back, were entitled to a percentage of the box office grosses, which, depending on how many tickets were sold, could be significantly more. The flat rate fee AIP received wasn't nothing, but in order to turn a real profit, or even just survive long term, they would have to reorient. And they did so by packaging together two of their upcoming B pictures into one offering for theaters, providing both halves of the traditional double feature instead of just one. That was able to secure them a percentage of ticket sales, but it only solved part of the problem. AIP just simply didn't have the money or the star power to make the same kinds of big prestige pictures that the majors were making. So the bigger issue begged the question that's plagued show business from the very start. How do you get butts in seats? One of the reasons why I think I'm so interested in the 50s is because that question was so rampant, so much more palpable than perhaps at any point before or since. A lot of what emerged from the instability of the time, all of the various strategies and gimmicks and innovations, were all potential solutions. How do you rope audiences back into theaters? Well, if you're AIP, the answer was clickbait. You are about to see a preview of the most fantastic advance ever to be made in the history of motion picture entertainment. The first double feature package AIP put together was the one-two punch Day the World Ended and The Phantom from 10,000 Leagues, two monster features that were each shot for under $100,000 and whose posters were adorned with terrifying monsters, the promise of horror, and a scantily clad woman thrown in for good measure. Both eye-catching and enticing, but both massively overselling what they actually were. Without the names and faces of popular actors that they could plaster over their posters and trailers, AIP had to rely solely on selling whatever concept their films were based around. And the easiest way to do that was to go as outlandish as you could. How do you stand out in a crowded market? Sensationalize. The double feature was successful and AIP was off and running. And for Arkoff and Nicholson, that strategy became the linchpin in their entire model. It wasn't something that they resorted to, but something that they started with. The big problem with most major companies then and now is a production department makes the picture, doesn't talk to anybody else, and when the picture is done, they go into the head of distribution and say, here's our picture, sell it. And after he's out of the door, the head of distribution says, how? The fact is, we started then with a title. Now, Jim Nicholson was the greatest title man I have ever met. And he'd say, Sam, what do you think of the title, I Was a Teenage Werewolf? I would say, my God, that's a million dollar title going on a hundred thousand dollar picture. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever a good title was conceived, AIP would hire an artist to design a poster, 
devise an entire ad campaign for the theoretical film, place all available elements in front of focus groups to gauge their marketability, and only when they received a promising enough response would they then set about raising the film's budget. Oh, and finally hiring somebody to write the script. People thought we were being odd, but in reality they were being back assward. Because if you look at any American or British manufacturing operation, they go out and test a product before they make it in any great bulk. They want to know there's a market. It's only been in the picture business that people make pictures that haven't the ghost of a chance. The first rule in AIP's ironclad method of clickbait, as Arkoff said, is the title. You want a good one? Go as pulpy and salacious as you can. Go for keywords like blood, bikini, riot, hellcat, cannibal, horror, terror, tap into atomic paranoia, sell aliens, sell ghouls, sell monsters from the deep. And don't worry about the actual movie skimping on whatever's promised on the posters. Cheapo monsters were something of an AIP specialty. I'll give you $100,000 right now, a sub-distributor in Boston once told Arkov, if you keep the title and poster for The Beast with a Million Eyes, but apply it to a new movie, and then burn the negative of this piece of junk. Designing a good poster can be chalked up to a simple equation. Sex plus horror, sex plus action, sex plus hot rods, or sex plus motorcycles equals almost guaranteed success. Last, sprinkle with a glowing tagline, and when in doubt, embellish. Leave the children at home, and if you're squeamish, stay home with them. Tommy! Tommy, I'm your friend! Horror was where they started, but AIP's dynamic duo found their greatest success when they tapped into the burgeoning teen market. See, Hollywood had just begun waking up to the idea that movies could be specifically made and marketed to teenagers, but Arkham and Nicholson cracked the formula faster than anyone else did. Get a gang of attractive youths, put them in a trendy hotspot, stir in some shenanigans, toss in a few pop songs, leave any parents and moral lessons at the door, and then sell big on the promise of fast cars, innocent sex, and most importantly, rebellion. Just what is it that you want to do? We want to be free to ride our machines without being hassled by the man. As the 50s turned into the 60s, this became AIP's real bread and butter. Low-budget exploitation fare churned out fast enough to capitalize on the latest craze, and the teen market was their prime audience. Combine this with the fact that they did significant business with the thousands of drive-ins that had exploded across the U.S. and the car-buying boom that followed the Second World War, a hotspot for teens and young couples probably there to do a little necking instead of a little movie watching, and AIP struck themselves a gold mine. Let's go to a drive-in! You can fault them for clickbaiting, but you can't fault them for knowing their audience. Just rope them in with the ad and let Backseat Bingo take care of the rest. And if they happen to pay attention, maybe they'll catch one of the good ones. Quality may have played second fiddle here, but it wasn't non-existent. Is there no end to your horrors? No. None whatever. And when consumer interest shifted, so too did their focus. You can see that with the teen films better than anything else. The way that they zigzag through the 60s, from rock and roll to juvenile delinquency, onto the beach parties, racing, protests, drugs. AIP's world was just one corner of the exploitation boom occurring at this time in American film history, but Arkov and Nicholson might just have been two of the industry's best hucksters. They didn't invent the rulebook on how to sell schlock and sleaze, but they played it like a sport riding the wave of consumer interests and trends in a way that the major studios could often be far slower to adapt to. In fact, theirs was the opposite of a major studio mindset that put all their eggs into just a few baskets counting on all of them to be slam dunk successes. AIP's sites were smaller, few of their movies were massive hits, but few were significant failures, and their model based around small budgets, tiny shooting schedules, rapid turnaround times, and sensationalist marketing kept their profits steady and the studio chugging along for decades. 
So why do I bring all this up? Because this kind of development and marketing strategy is everywhere. It may have evolved since AIP's glory days, but the core idea is still the same. You know, I met an indie producer a few years ago who said that one of the biggest portions of his film's revenue came from DVD sales at Walmart, and that the key driver wasn't so much the film's quality, but the right shelf placement and an eye-catching cover. And what is that if not just a page out of AIP's playbook? It's not the sexiest side of Hollywood, but it's certainly a reality of it, particularly in the low-budget world. The film industry is a carnival business, Sam Markov used to say. And he was right. But hey, at least the ads are great. A distributor that AIP once worked with said that he hated the films but loved the ad campaigns so much that he wished he could cut sprocket holes into the posters and release them instead. He might have been onto something. Hey everybody, thanks so much for watching. This was such a fun video to put together. I hope you liked it. The ins and outs of film history is something that I'm constantly fascinated by. And you know, we obviously live in a time where there are so many different options for entertainment that trying to branch out to find great new movies you haven't seen before can honestly seem a bit overwhelming. But if you're looking for a reliable place to start, I'd highly recommend Mubi. Mubi premieres a new film every day. From exciting work by up-and-coming directors to timeless classics from master directors to cult favorites you've never seen. And their strategy is one that I think is really brilliant. Instead of dumping just anything and everything onto the service, every film is curated. Therefore, every film feels special, like the staff pick section at a video store. And unlike other streaming services, I found that I wind up spending way less time browsing through endless titles and adding things to watch lists, and more time actually watching. Whether you're a cinephile or a film school freshman, there's always something new to discover. It's like having your own personal film festival streaming anytime, anywhere. If you're interested in giving Mubi a try, you can get an entire month of great cinema for free by going to mubi.com slash royalocean to sign up today.